Section 1 of How to Tell a Story and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claudia Salto. How to Tell a Story and Other Essays by Mark Twain. Section 1 How to Tell a Story. The humorous story an American development, its difference from comic and witty stories. I do not claim that I can tell a story as it ought to be told. I only claim to know how a story ought to be told, for I have been almost daily in the company of the most expert storytellers for many years. There are several kinds of stories, but only one difficult kind, the humorous. I will talk mainly about that one. The humorous story is American. The comic story is English. The witty story is French. The humorous story depends for its effect upon the manner of the telling. The comic story and the witty story upon the matter. The humorous story may be spun out to great length, and may wander around as much as it pleases, and arrive nowhere in particular, but the comic and witty stories must be brief and end with a point. The humorous story bubbles gently along, the others burst. The humorous story is strictly a work of art high and delicate art, and only an artist can tell it, but no art is necessary in telling the comic and the witty story. Anybody can do it. The art of telling a humorous story, understand, I mean by word of mouth, not print, was created in America and has remained at home. The humorous story is told gravely. The teller does his best to conceal the fact that he even dimly suspects that there is anything funny about it. But the teller of the comic story tells you beforehand that it is one of the funniest things he has ever heard, then tells it with eager delight, and is the first person to laugh when he gets through. And sometimes, if he has had good success, he is so glad and happy that he will repeat the nub of it and glance round from face to face collecting applause and then repeat it again. It is a pathetic thing to see. Very often, of course, the rambling and disjointed humorous story finishes with a nub, point, snapper, or whatever you like to call it. Then the listener must be alert, for in many cases the teller will divert attention from that nub by dropping it in a carefully casual and indifferent way, with a pretense that he does not know it is a nub. Artemis Ward used that trick a good deal. Then, when the belated audience presently caught the joke, he would look up with innocent surprise, as if wondering what they had found to laugh at. Dan Satchel used it before him, Nye and Riley and others use it today. But the teller of the comic story does not slur the nub. He shouts it at you every time. And when he prints it in England, France, Germany, and Italy, he italicizes it, puts some whooping exclamation points after it, and sometimes explains it in a parenthesis. All of which is very depressing and makes one want to renounce joking and lead a better life. Let me set down an instance of the comic method, using an anecdote which has been popular all over the world for twelve or fifteen hundred years. 
The teller tells it in this way. The Wounded Soldier In the course of a certain battle, a soldier whose leg had been shot off appealed to another soldier who was hurrying by to carry him to the rear, informing him at the same time of the loss which he had sustained, whereupon the generous son of Mars, shouldering the unfortunate, proceeded to carry out his desire. The bullets and cannonballs were flying in all directions, and presently one of the latter took the wounded man's head off, without, however, his deliverer being aware of it. In no long time he was hailed by an officer who said, "'Where are you going with that carcass?' To the rear, sir, he's lost his leg. His leg, forsooth, responded the astonished officer. You mean his head, you booby. Whereupon the soldier dispossessed himself of his burden, and stood looking down upon it in great perplexity. At length he said, It is true, sir, just as you have said. Then, after a pause, he added, but he told me it was his leg. Here the narrator bursts into explosion after explosion of thunderous horse laughter, repeating that nub from time to time through his gaspings and shriekings and suffocatings. It takes only a minute and a half to tell that in its comic story form, and isn't worth the telling after all. Put into the humorous story form, it takes ten minutes and is about the funniest thing I have ever listened to, as James Whitcomb Riley tells it. He tells it in the character of a dull-witted old farmer who has just heard it for the first time, thinks it is unspeakably funny, and is trying to repeat it to a neighbor. But he can't remember it, so he gets all mixed up and wanders helplessly round and round, putting in tedious details that don't belong in the tale and only retard it, taking them out conscientiously and putting in others that are just as useless, making minor mistakes, now and then stopping to correct them and explain how he came to make them, remembering things which he forgot to put in in their proper place and going back to put them in there, stopping his narrative a good while in order to try to recall the name of the soldier that was hurt, and finally remembering that the soldier's name was not mentioned, and remarking placidly that the name is of no real importance anyway. Better, of course, if one knew it, but not essential after all. And so on, and so on, and so on. The teller is innocent and happy and pleased with himself, and has to stop every little while to hold himself in and keep from laughing outright, and does hold in, but his body quakes in a jelly-like way with interior chuckles, and at the end of the ten minutes the audience have laughed until they are exhausted and the tears are running down their faces. The simplicity and innocence and sincerity and unconsciousness of the old farmer are perfectly simulated, and the result is a performance which is thoroughly charming and delicious. This is art and fine and beautiful, and only a master can compass it, but a machine could tell the other story. To string incongruities and absurdities together in a wandering and sometimes purposeless way, and seem innocently unaware that they are absurdities, is the basis of the American art, if my position is correct. Another feature is the slurring of the point. A third is the dropping of a studied remark, apparently without knowing it, as if one were thinking aloud. 
the fourth and last is the pause artemis ward dealt in numbers three and four a good deal he would begin to tell with great animation something which he seemed to think was wonderful then lose confidence and after an apparently absent-minded pause at an incongruous remark in a soliloquizing way and that was the remark intended to explode the mine and it did for instance he would say eagerly excitedly i once knew a man in new zealand who had a tooth in his head here his animation would die out a silent reflective pause would follow then he would say dreamily and as if to himself and yet that man could beat a drum better than any man i ever saw the pause is an exceedingly important feature in any kind of story and a frequently recurring feature too it is a dainty thing and delicate and also uncertain and treacherous for it must be exactly the right length no more and no less or it fails of its purpose and makes trouble if the pause is too short the impressive point is past and and if too long the audience have had time to divine that a surprise is intended and then you can't surprise them of course on the platform i used to tell a negro ghost story that had a pause in front of the snapper on the end and that pause was the most important thing in the whole story if i got it the right length precisely i could spring the finishing ejaculation with effect enough to make some impressible girl deliver a startled little yelp and jump out of her seat and that was what i was after this story was called the golden arm and was told in this fashion you can practice with it yourself and mind you look out for the pause and get it right the golden arm once upon a time there was a monstrous mean man and he lived way out in the prairie all alone by himself settin he had a wife and by me by she died and he took in toted her way out there in the prairie and buried her well she had a golden arm all solid gold from the shoulder down he was powerful mean powerful and that night he couldn't sleep gaze he want that golden arm so bad when it come midnight he couldn't stand it no more so he get up he did and took his lantern and shoved out through the storm and dug her up and got the golden arm and he bent his head down gin the wind and ploughed and ploughed and ploughed through the snow then all on a sudden he stop make a considerable pause here and look startled and take a listening attitude and say my land what's that and he listen and listen and the wind say set your teeth together and imitate the wailing and wheezing sing-song of the wind Bzzz, and then way back yonder where the grave is he hear a voice he hear a voice all mix up in the wind can't hardly tell i'm part who got my golden arm who got my golden arm you must begin to shiver violently now and he begin to shiver and shake and say oh my oh my lan and the wind blow the lantern out 
and there's no wind sleet blow in his face and most choke him and he start a ploughing knee deep towards home most dead he's so scared and pooty soon he hear their voice again and pause it is coming after him who got my golden arm when he git to the pasture he hear it again closer now in a coming a coming back da in the dark in the storm repeat the wind and the voice when he git to the house he rush upstairs and jump in the bed and kiver up head and years and lay da shiverin and shakin and then way out da he hear it again and a comin and by me by he hear pause odd listening attitude pat 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 it's a comin upstairs then he hear the latch and he know it's in the room then pooty soon he know it's a standin by the bed pause then he know it's a bending down over him and he can scarcely get his breath then then he seemed to feel something cold right down most again his head pause then the voice say right at his ear who got my golden arm you must wail it out very plaintively and accusingly then you stare steadily and impressively into the face of the farthest gone auditor a girl preferably and let that awe-inspiring pause begin to build itself in the deep hush when it has reached exactly the right length jump suddenly at that girl and yell you've got it if you've got the pause right she'll fetch a dear little yelp and spring right out of her shoes but you must get the pause right and you will find it the most troublesome and aggravating and uncertain thing you ever undertook end of section one Of How to Tell a Story and Other Essays by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mental Telegraphy Again. I have three or four curious incidents to tell about. They seem to come under the head of what I named Mental Telegraphy in a paper written seventeen years ago and published long afterwards. The paper entitled Mental Telegraphy, which originally appeared in Harper's Magazine for December 1893, is included in the volume entitled The American Claimant and Other Stories and Sketches. Several years ago, I made a campaign on the platform with Mr. George W. Cable. In Montreal, we were honored with the reception. It began at two in the afternoon in a long drawing-room in the Windsor Hotel. Mr. Cable and I stood at one end of this room, and the ladies and gentlemen entered it at the other end, crossed it at that end, then came up the long left-hand side, shook hands with us, said a word or two, and passed on in the usual way my sight is of the telescopic sort and i presently recognized a familiar face among the throng of strangers drifting in at the distant door and i said to myself with surprise and high gratification that is mrs r i had forgotten that she was a canadian she had been a great friend of mine in carson city nevada in the early days I had not seen her or heard of her for twenty years. 
I had not been thinking about her. There was nothing to suggest her to me, nothing to bring her to my mind. In fact, to me, she had long ago ceased to exist and had disappeared from my consciousness. But I knew her instantly, and I saw her so clearly that I was able to note some of the particulars of her dress, and did note them, and they remained in my mind. I was impatient for her to come. In the midst of the handshakings, I snatched glimpses of her and noted her progress with a slow moving file across the end of the room. Then I saw her start up the side, and this gave me a full front view of her face. I saw her last when she was within twenty five feet of me. For an hour, I kept thinking she must still be in the room somewhere and would come at last but I was disappointed. When I arrived in the lecture hall that evening, someone said, Come into the waiting room. There's a friend of yours there who wants to see you. You'll not be introduced. You are to do the recognizing without help, if you can. I said to myself, It is Mrs. R. I shan't have any trouble. There were perhaps ten ladies present, all seated. In the midst of them was Mrs. R., as I had expected. She was dressed exactly as she was when I had seen her in the afternoon. I went forward and shook hands with her and called her by name and said, I knew you the moment you appeared at the reception this afternoon. She looked surprised and said, But I was not at the reception. I have just arrived from Quebec and have not been in town an hour. It was my turn to be surprised now. I said, I can't help it. I give you my word of honor that it is as I say. I saw you at the reception, and you were dressed precisely as you are now. When they told me a moment ago that I should find a friend in this room, your image rose before me, dress and all, just as I had seen you at the reception. Those are the facts. She was not at the reception at all, or anywhere near it, but I saw her there, nevertheless, and most clearly and unmistakably. To that I could make oath. How is one to explain this? I was not thinking of her at the time, had not thought of her for years, but she had been thinking of me, no doubt. Did her thoughts flit through leagues of air to me, and bring with it that clear and pleasant vision of herself? I think so. That was and remains my sole experience in the matter of apparitions. I mean, apparitions that come when one is, ostensibly, awake. I could have been asleep for a moment. The apparition could have been the creature of a dream. Still. That is nothing to the point. The feature of interest is the happening of the thing just at that time, instead of at an earlier or later time, which is argument that its origin lay in thought transference. My next incident will be set aside by most persons as being merely a coincidence, I suppose. Years ago, I used to think sometimes of making a lecturing trip through the antipodes and the borders of the Orient, but always gave up the idea, partly because of the great length of the journey and partly because my wife could not well manage to go with me. Towards the end of last January, that idea, after an interval of years, came suddenly into my head again, forcefully too, and without any apparent reason. Whence came it? What suggested it? I will touch upon that presently. I was at that time where I am now, in Paris. I wrote at once to Henry M. Stanley, London, and asked him some questions about his Australian lecture tour, and inquired who had conducted him and what were the terms. After a day or two his answer came. It began, the lecture agent for Australia and New Zealand is par excellence Mr. R. S. Smythe of Melbourne. He added his itinerary, terms, sea expenses and some other matters, and advised me to write Mr. Smythe, 
which I did February 3rd. I began my letter by saying in substance that while he did not know me personally, we had a mutual friend in Stanley, and that would answer for an introduction. Then I proposed my trip, and asked if he would give me the same terms which he had given Stanley. I mailed my letter to Mr. Smythe February 6th, and three days later I got a letter from the self-same Smythe, dated Melbourne, December 17th. I would as soon have expected to get a letter from the late George Washington. The letter began somewhat as mine to him had begun, with a self-introduction. Dear Mr. Clemens, it is so long since Archibald Forbes and I spent that pleasant afternoon in your comfortable house at Hartford that you have probably quite forgotten the occasion. In the course of his letter this occurs. I am willing to give you, here he named the terms which he had given Stanley, for an antipodian tour to last, say, three months. Here was the single essential detail of my letter answered three days after I had mailed my inquiry. I might have saved myself the trouble and the postage, and a few years ago I would have done that very thing, for I would have argued that my sudden and strong impulse to write and ask some questions of a stranger on the other side of the globe meant that the impulse came from that stranger, and that he would answer my questions of his own motion if I would let him alone. Mr. Smythe's letter probably passed under my nose on its way to lose three weeks travelling to America and back, and gave me a whiff of its content as it went along. Letters often act like that. Instead of the thought coming to you in an instant from Australia, the apparently unsentient letter imparts it to you as it glides invisibly past your elbow in the mail bag. Next incident. In the following month, March, I was in America. I spent a Sunday at Irvington on the Hudson with Mr. John Brisbane Walker of the Cosmopolitan magazine. We came into New York next morning and went to the Century Club for luncheon. He said some praiseful things about the character of the club and the orderly serenity and pleasantness of its quarters, and asked if I had never tried to acquire membership in it. I said I had not, and that New York clubs were a continuous expense to the country members without being of frequent use or benefit to them. And now I've got an idea, said I. There's the Lotus, the first New York club I was ever a member of, my very earliest love in that line. I have been a member of it for considerably more than twenty years, yet have seldom had a chance to look in and see the boys. They turn grey and grow old, while I am not watching, and my dues go on. I am going to Hartford this afternoon for a day or two, but as soon as I get back I will go to John Elderkin very privately and say, Remember the veteran and confer distinction upon him for the sake of old times. Make me an honorary member and abolish the tax. If you haven't any such thing as honorary membership, all the better created for my honor and glory. That would be a great thing. I will go to John Elderkin as soon as I get back from Hartford. I took the last express that afternoon, first telegraphing Mr. F. G. Whitmore to come and see me next day. When he came, he asked, did you get a letter from Mr. John Elderkin, secretary of the Lotus Club, before you left New York? Then it just missed you. If I had known you were coming, I would have kept it. It is beautiful and will make you proud. The board of directors, by unanimous vote, have made you a life member and squelched those dues. 
and you are to be on hand and receive your distinction on the night of the thirtieth which is the twenty-fifth anniversary of the founding of the club and it will not surprise me if they have some great times there what put the honorary membership in my head that day in the century club for i had never thought of it before i don't know what brought the thought to me at that particular time instead of earlier but i am well satisfied that it originated with the board of directors and had been on its way to my brain through the air even since the moment that saw their vote recorded another incident i was in hartford two or three days as a guest of the rev joseph h twitchell i have held the rank of honorary uncle to his children for a quarter of a century and i went out with him in the trolley car to visit one of my nieces who is at miss porter's famous school in farmington the distance is eight or nine miles on the way talking i illustrated something with an anecdote this is the anecdote two years and a half ago i and the family arrived at milan on our way to rome and stopped at the continental after dinner i went below and took a seat in the stone paved court where the customary lemon trees stand in the customary tubs and said to myself now this is comfort comfort and repose and nobody to disturb it i don't know anybody in milan then a young gentleman stepped up and shook hands which damaged my theory he said in substance you won't remember me mr clemens but i remember you very well i was a cadet at west point when you and rev joseph h twitchell came there some years ago and talked to us on a hundredth night i am a lieutenant in the regular army now and my name is h i am in europe all alone for a modest little tour my regiment is in arizona we became friendly and sociable and in the course of the talk he told me of an adventure which had befallen him about to this effect i was at bellagio stopping at the big hotel there and ten days ago i lost my letter of credit i did not know what in the world to do i was a stranger i knew no one in europe i hadn't a penny in my pocket i couldn't even send a telegram to london to get my lost letter replaced my hotel bill was a week old and the presentation of it imminent so imminent that it could happen at any moment now i was so frightened that my wits seemed to leave me i tramped and tramped back and forth like a crazy person if anybody approached me i hurried away for no matter what a person looked like i took him for the head waiter with a bill i was at last in such a desperate state that i was ready to do any wild thing that promised even the shadow of help and so this is the insane thing that i did i saw a family lunching at a small table on the redonda and recognized their nationality americans father mother and several young daughters young tastefully dressed and pretty the rule with our people i went straight there in my civilian costume named my name said i was a lieutenant in the army and told my story and asked for help what do you suppose the gentleman did but you would not guess in twenty years he took out a handful of gold coin and told me to help myself freely that is what he did the next morning the lieutenant told me his new letter of credit had arrived in the night so we strolled to cook's to draw money to pay back the benefactor with we got it and then went strolling through the great arcade presently he said yonder they are come and be introduced 
I was introduced to the parents and the young ladies, then we separated, and I never saw him or them any m Here we are at Farmington, said Twitchell, interrupting. We left the trolley car and tramped through the mud a hundred yards or so to the school, talking about the time we and Warner walked out there years ago and the pleasant time we had. We had a visit with my niece in the parlor, then started for the trolley again. Outside the house we encountered a double rank of twenty or thirty of Miss Porter's young ladies arriving from a walk, and we stood aside, ostensibly, to let them have room to file past, but really to look at them. Presently one of them stepped out of the rank and said, "'You don't know me, Mr. Twitchell, but I know your daughter, and that gives me the privilege of shaking hands with you.' Then she put out her hand to me and said, And I wish to shake hands with you too, Mr. Clemens. You don't remember me, but you were introduced to me in the Arcade Milan two years and a half ago by Lieutenant H. What had put that story into my head after all that stretch of time? Was it just the proximity of the young girl, or was it merely an odd accident? End of section two. Section three of How to Tell a Story and Other Essays by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Invalid's Story. I seem sixty and married. But these effects are due to my condition and sufferings, for I am a bachelor and only forty-one. It will be hard for you to believe that I, who am now but a shadow, was a hale, hearty man two short years ago, a man of iron, a very athlete. Yet such is the simple truth. But stranger still than this fact is the way in which I lost my health. I lost it through helping to take care of a box of guns on a two hundred mile railway journey one winter's night. It is the actual truth, and I will tell you about it. I belong in Cleveland, Ohio. One winter's night, two years ago, I reached home just after dark in a driving snowstorm, and the first thing I heard when I entered the house was that my dearest boyhood friend and schoolmate John B. Hackett had died the day before, and that his last utterance had been a desire that I would take his remains home to his poor old father and mother in Wisconsin. I was greatly shocked and grieved, but there was no time to waste in emotions. I must start at once. I took the card marked Deacon Levi Hackett, Bethlehem, Wisconsin, and hurried off through the whistling storm to the railway station. Arrived there, I found the long white pine box which had been described to me. I fastened the cart to it with some tacks, saw it put safely aboard the express car, and then ran into the eating room to provide myself with a sandwich and some cigars. When I returned presently, there was my coffin box back again, apparently, and a young fellow examining around it with a card in his hand and some tacks and a hammer. I was astonished and puzzled. He began to nail on his card, and I rushed out to the express car in a good deal of a state of mind to ask for an explanation. But no, there was my box all right in the express car it hadn't been disturbed the fact is that without my suspecting it a prodigious mistake had been made 
I was carrying off a box of guns which that young fellow had come to the station to ship to a rifle company in Peoria, Illinois, and he had got my corpse. Just then the conductor sung out, All aboard! and I jumped into the express car and got a comfortable seat on a bale of buckets. The expressman was there, hard at work, a plain man of fifty, with a simple, honest, good-natured face, and a breezy, practical heartiness in his general style. As the train moved off, a stranger skipped into the car and set a package of peculiarly mature and capable Limburger cheese on one end of my coffin box, I mean my box of guns. That is to say, I know now that it was Limburger cheese, but at that time I never had heard of the article in my life, and of course I was wholly ignorant of its character. Well, we sped through the wild night. The bitter storm raged on. A cheerless misery stole over me. My heart went down, down, down. The old expressman made a brisk remark or two about the tempest and the arctic weather, slammed his sliding doors to and bolted them, closed his window down tight, and then went bustling around, here and there and yonder, setting things to rights, and all the time contentedly humming, Sweet by and by, in a low tone, and flatting a good deal. Presently I began to detect a most evil and searching odor stealing about on the frozen air. This depressed my spirits still more, because, of course, I attributed it to my poor departed friend. There was something infinitely saddening about his calling himself to my remembrance in this dumb, pathetic way, so it was hard to keep the tears back. Moreover, it distressed me on account of the old expressman, who, I was afraid, might notice it. However, he went humming tranquilly on, and gave no sign, and for this I was grateful. Grateful, yes, but still uneasy, and soon I began to feel more and more uneasy every minute, for every minute that went by that odour thickened up the more, and got to be more and more gamey and hard to stand. Presently, having got things arranged to his satisfaction, the expressman got some wood and made up a tremendous fire in his stove. This distressed me more than I can tell, for I could not but feel that it was a mistake. I was sure that the effect would be deleterious upon my poor departed friend. Thompson, the expressman's name was Thompson, as I found out in the course of the night, now went poking around his car, stopping up whatever stray cracks he could find, remarking that it didn't make any difference what kind of a night it was outside, he calculated to make us comfortable anyway. I said nothing, but I believed he was not choosing the right way. Meantime, he was humming to himself just as before, and meantime, too, the stove was getting hotter and hotter, and the place closer and closer. I felt myself growing pale and qualmish, but grieved in silence, and said nothing. Soon I noticed that the sweet by and by was gradually fading out, Next it ceased altogether, and there was an ominous stillness. After a few moments Thompson said, Phew! I reckon it ain't no cinnamon I've loaded up this year stove with. He gasped once or twice, then moved toward the cough uh, gun box, stood over that Limburger cheese part of a moment, then came back and sat down near me, looking a good deal impressed. 
after a contemplative pause, he said, indicating the box with a gesture. Friend of yourn? Yes, I said with a sigh. He's pretty ripe, ain't he? Nothing further was said for perhaps a couple of minutes, each being busy with his own thoughts. Then Thompson said in a low, awed voice, Sometimes it's uncertain whether they're really gone or not. Seem gone, you know. Body warm, joints limber, and so, although you think they're gone, you don't really know. I've had cases in my car. It's perfectly awful, because you don't know what minute they rise up and look at you. Then, after a pause, and slightly lifting his elbow toward the box, but he ain't in no trance, no, sir. I go bail for him. We sat some time in meditative silence, listening to the wind and the roar of the train. Then Thompson said, with a good deal of feeling, Well, well, we've all got to go. They ain't no getting around it. Man that is born of woman is of few days and far between, as scripture says. Yes. You look at it any way you want to. It's awful solemn and curious. They ain't nobody can get around it. All's got to go. Just everybody, as you may say. One day you are hearty and strong. Here he scrambled to his feet and broke a pane and stretched his nose out at it a moment or two then sat down again while i struggled up and thrust my nose out at the same place and this we kept on doing every now and then and next day he's cut down like the grass and the places which knowed him then knows him no more for ever as scripture says yes indeedy it's awful solemn and curious but we've all got to go one time or another they ain't no getting around it. There was another long pause, then. What did he die of? I said I didn't know. How long has he been dead? It seemed judicious to enlarge the facts to fit the probabilities, so I said, Two or three days. But it did no good, for Thompson received it with an injured look which plainly said, Two or three years, you mean? Then he went right along, placidly ignoring my statement, and gave his views at considerable length upon the unwisdom of putting off burials too long. Then he launched off toward the box, stood a moment, then came back on a sharp trot, and visited the broken pane, observing, "'It would have been a dumb sight better all around if they'd started him along last summer.' Thompson sat down and buried his face in his red silk handkerchief, and began to slowly sway and rock his body like one who is doing his best to endure the almost unendurable. By this time the fragrance, if you may call it fragrance, was just about suffocating, as near as you can come at it. Thompson's face was turning grey. I knew mine hadn't any colour left in it. By and by, Thompson rested his forehead in his left hand, with his elbow on his knee, and sort of waved his red handkerchief towards the box with his other hand, and said, I've carried a many a one of em, some of em considerable overdue too, but lordy, he just lays over em all and does it easy. Cap, they was heliotrope to him. This recognition of my poor friend gratified me, in spite of the sad circumstances, because it had so much the sound of a compliment. Pretty soon it was plain that something had got to be done. I suggested cigars. Thompson thought it was a good idea. He said, 
Likely it'll modify him some. We puffed gingerly along for a while, and tried hard to imagine that things were improved. But it wasn't any use. Before very long, and without any consultation, both cigars were quietly dropped from our nerveless fingers, and at the same moment Thompson said with a sigh, No, Cap, it don't modify him worth a cent. Fact is, it makes him worse, because it appears to stir up his ambition. What do you reckon we better do now? I was not able to suggest anything. Indeed, I had to be swallowing and swallowing all the time, and did not like to trust myself to speak. Thompson fell to maundering in a desultory and low-spirited way about the miserable experiences of this night, and he got to referring to my poor friend by various titles, sometimes military ones, sometimes civil ones, and I noticed that as fast as my poor friend's effectiveness grew, Thompson promoted him accordingly, gave him a bigger title. Finally, he said, I've got an idea. Supposin' we buckle down to it and give the colonel a bit of a shove towards t'other end of the car? About ten foot, say. He wouldn't have so much influence then, don't you reckon? I said it was a good scheme. So we took in a good fresh breath at the broken pane, calculating to hold it till we got through. Then we went there and bent over that deadly cheese and took a grip on the box. Thompson nodded, all ready, and then we threw ourselves forward with all our might. But Thompson slipped and slumped down with his nose on the cheese, and his breath got loose. He gagged and gasped and floundered up and made a break for the door, pawing at the air and saying hoarsely, Don't hinder me. Give me the road. I'm a-dying. Give me the road. Out on the cold platform I sat down and held his head a while, and he revived. Presently he said, Do you reckon we started the general any? I said no. We hadn't budged him. Well, then, that idea's up the flume. We got to think up something else. He's suited where he is, I reckon, and if that's the way he feels about it, and has made up his mind that he don't wish to be disturbed, you bet he's a-going to have his own way in the business. Yes, better leave him right where he is, long as he wants it so, because he holds all the trumps, don't you know, and so it stands to reason that the man that lays out to alter his plans for him is going to get left. But we couldn't stay out there in that mad storm. We should have frozen to death. So we went in again and shut the door, and began to suffer once more and take turns at the break in the window. By and by, as we were starting away from a station where we had stopped a moment, Thompson pranced in cheerily and exclaimed, We're all right now. I reckon we've got the Commodore this time. I judge I've got the stuff here that'll take the tuck out of him. It was carbolic acid. He had a carboy of it. He sprinkled it all around everywhere. In fact, he drenched everything with it, rifle box, cheese, and all. Then we sat down, feeling pretty hopeful. But it wasn't for long. You see, the two perfumes began to mix, and then... Well, pretty soon we made a break for the door, and out there Thompson swabbed his face with his bandana and said in a kind of disheartened way, 
It ain't no use. We can't buck again him. He just utilizes everything we put up to modify him with, and gives it his own flavor and plays it back on us. Why, Cap, don't you know, it's as much as a hundred times worse in there now than it was when he first got a-going. I never did see one of em warm up to his work so, and take such a damnation interest in it. No, sir, I never did, as long I've been on the road, and I've carried a many a one of em, as I was telling you. We went in again after we were frozen pretty stiff, but my, we couldn't stay in now, so we just waltzed back and forth, freezing and thawing and stifling by turns. In about an hour we stopped at another station, and as we left it, Thompson came in with a bag and said, Cap, I'm going to chance him once more just this once, and if we don't fetch him this time, the thing for us to do is to just throw up the sponge and withdraw from the canvas. That's the way I put it up. He had brought a lot of chicken feathers and dried apples and leaf tobacco and rags and old shoes and sulphur and as a fatida, and one thing or another, and he piled them on a breadth of sheet iron in the middle of the floor, and set fire to them. When they got well started, I couldn't see, myself, how even the corpse could stand it. All that went before was just simply poetry to that smell. But mind you, the original smell stood up out of it just as sublime as ever. Fact is, these other smells just seemed to give it better hold, and my, how rich it was! I didn't make these reflections there, there wasn't time, made them on the platform. And breaking for the platform, Thompson got suffocated and fell and before I got him dragged out, which I did by the collar, I was mighty near gone myself. When we revived, Thompson said dejectedly, We got to stay out here, Cap. We got to do it. They ain't no other way. The governor wants to travel alone, and he's fixed so he can outvote us. And presently he added, and don't you know, we're pisant. It's our last trip. You can make up your mind to it. Typhoid fever is what's going to come of this. I feel it a-coming right now. Yes, sir, we're elected just as sure as you're born. We were taken from the platform an hour later frozen and insensible at the next station, and I went straight off into a virulent fever, and never knew anything again for three weeks. I found out then that I had spent that awful night with a harmless box of rifles and a lot of innocent cheese, but the news was too late to save me. Imagination had done its work and my health was permanently shattered. Neither Bermuda nor any other land can ever bring it back to me. This is my last trip. I am on my way home to die. End of section 3 End of How to Tell a Story and Other Essays by Mark Twain